rigid body dynamics. So this is basically continuing exactly where we left off when we did lecture 11, multi-particles systems. And we did talk about the idea of rigidity and combining particles. And we've got enough background now in the rigid body kinematics that we can now put all the pieces together and start talking about how rigid bodies, and this will be my favorite one, this piece of foam, um, how it moves in space. The great thing about space, there aren't that many environmental factors going on. It's not like something being thrown in the wind or in the ocean. Rigid body dynamics. And the book, I think, calls this Eulerian mechanics. We are in chapter four now, and we'll end in chapter four. So this is it. We're continuing from lecture 11. So you could look back at lecture 11, that might be helpful. But we went from discrete masses. Right? We were talking about if you have a system of particles and they're all rigidly attached one to another, the only thing that this thing can do is translate and rotate. And to find out things like the center of mass and the moment of inertia matrix, we did a discrete sum over the masses. And now when we go to the continuous limit, instead of discrete masses, we'll have a density distribution. And I'll probably use some symbol like this. It's density as a function of position within the body, and we'll go to an integral. So instead of a sum, we'll do an integral. Think of it as a triple integral over the volume for a continuous system. And when you start out calculating for something like this, uh, let me put the sort of back side of this. You need to pick some kind of origin initially. So maybe we'd call this the V1, V2, V3. And let's say you don't know anything about the mass distribution, the center of mass, or the moments of inertia. You do an integral based on some chosen origin and you sum over a bunch of little volume elements. You could also think of it as a mass element. So the mass element will be the density in that element times the volume in that element. And following the convention of the book, I'll use little r if we're talking about things relative to the body, even if it's relative to the center of mass. So this dv, if we were to write everything in terms of like x, y, and z, this would be a dx, dy, dz. Using vector calculus, right? you could write volume elements in terms of spherical coordinates or cylindrical coordinates or whatever. We'll often assume that the material kind of like this thing has a basically constant density within it, but you might have a, a material that does not have a constant density. If it does have a constant density, then that simplifies things. It means that rho isn't a function of R, it's just a constant. And so it'll come out of integrals. So that's a good thing. It simplifies stuff. We talked about the center of mass, the mass distribution, which gives the moment of inertia matrix. So we're going to say some more things about the moment of inertia matrix, because that's sort of a big deal. Rigid body dynamics is based on Euler's equation. And that was the one where you've got the angular momentum and the most, and what's relevant when you're out in space is you've got the center of mass. And we're looking at how the angular momentum of the body about the center of mass, see how it evolves in time. And we often write the angular momentum in terms of the angular velocity. And the way that we would write that is we write the moment of inertia matrix times the angular velocity. And this is the angular velocity of the body fixed frame with respect to an inertial frame. And remember, this just means direction. So we've got some inertial directions. We've got some body fixed directions. We write all of these in terms of body fixed frame components. It'll end up simplifying the equations of motion when we get to the equations of motion. We haven't yet said what Euler's equation is, at least today. We write all in body fixed, that means B frame components. As a reminder, we could do superscripts in the front. Sometimes I'll write subscripts and it means the same thing. It's just, you know, sometimes it gets in the way of that C. So you just have to be aware. I'll use subscripts or superscripts and hopefully it's clear that just means body fixed frame. You'll get so used to writing things in the body fixed frame, you won't really think about it much anymore. I guess we could put brackets around those if we want to, but so this defines the angular momentum in terms of the angular velocity. And it's related through the moment of inertia matrix. That's what this is. It represents the mass distribution. And we even said what this was in lecture 11. We just sort of ended with it. 
about how you would write this integral for a continuous mass distribution. It would be this way. I see written in the body fixed frame, like I said, I'll use either superscripts or subscripts means the same thing. I'm just writing in the body fixed frame. It is a triple integral over, I'll use this script B to represent the body. Maybe we'll put the, another diagram of the body here. We're to do our initial calculations. So we'll assume that we've already calculated where the center of mass is. So it's our center of mass. And it's probably helpful to think of the body fixed frame as centered at the center of mass. And then each little chunk, dx, dy, dz, we're going to be integrating. So this is a triple integral of density at that point. And then what we ended with in lecture 11, it's the magnitude of the vector from the center of mass to that infinitesimal volume squared times the three by three identity minus the location of that mass cube written in the body fixed frame. So this is a column vector times R transpose dx, dy, dz. You write it as a column. And then this is because we're taking the transpose, it's written as a row. This is already a three by three matrix. You multiply a column times a row, you get another three by three matrix. If we suppose the density is uniform, then like we said, the density becomes just a constant. We could pull it out of the integral. We'll get uh, I C equals the density. And now we do our triple integral over the body. This is the body. So think of density as something constant inside that and it's zero everywhere else, but we're just integrating over the body. Okay, so what do we get for these things if we write R? The book writes it as R1, R2, R3. I think it's easier to write if we think in terms of X, Y, and Z. All right, so X is along the B1 direction, Y is along the B2, and Z is along the B3. So what we get from this, R squared up here is going to be X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared along the diagonal, because we're just, we're multiplying that times the three by three identity, but then we'll be subtracting off some weird thing. If you work out what that matrix multiplication gives you, then it'll be X squared, XY, XZ, XY, Y squared, YZ, XZ, YZ, Z squared. Again, that whole thing integrated over DX, DY, DZ. We could simplify this, right? Just subtract the two matrices and work it out. So it's the constant density times one matrix. Just Y squared plus Z squared minus XY. You're like, whoa, minus signs, what's up? Yeah, minus signs. Minus YX, I'll just say it's XY. X squared plus Z squared minus YZ. And then this is minus, it's ZX. So that's the same as XZ minus ZY, which is the same as YZ, X squared plus Y squared. That's probably one to be thinking about. I've written it in terms of a volume integral. This is very similar to equation 4.14, the book. Now these elements, we could start writing them. There's a common way to write them. So as elements of the I matrix, there's a typical way to write that. Well, any matrix. I11, I'll do the diagonal first. I22, I33. And then the off diagonal elements. I12, and it's the same. So I21 is the same as I12, if you look at what it looks like in terms of the integral. And then this is I13, I23, and it's the same down here, I23, I13. So notice, let's remind ourselves it's in the body fixed frame. Notice this matrix, just viewed as a, a mathematical object, a three by three matrix, it is symmetric. In fact, it's not only symmetric, and this is sort of a mathematical aside, it's also positive definite. Because it's a symmetric matrix, we know that it will have all real eigenvalues because eventually we'll get to calculating the eigenvalues of this. The eigenvalues and the eigenvectors will have a special interpretation. So because it's symmetric, that means all real eigenvalues. Being positive definite and symmetric means that it's all positive real eigenvalues. And there's another property that we'll get to, but we have to first write it in another form. Hopefully it's clear what these elements are, you know, for example, what is I11? I11 is density times this triple integral of y squared plus z squared integrated over the body dx, dy, dz. This is a measure of how difficult it is, meaning how much resistance there will be to rotate about the number one axis. And by resistance, I mean how much inertial resistance, just like mass is a measure of how 
kind of difficult it is to get something moving with a force. Moments of inertia are the rotational counterpart of that. So it's how difficult is it to get something to rotate, to rotate the object, the rigid body about the B1 axis, the number one axis, the X axis, whatever you want to call it. So similarly for I22, I33, these are called the moments of inertia. And I know that's confusing because we this, this entire matrix is called the moment of inertia matrix. Sometimes people want to be fancy and call it the moment of inertia tensor. And there is some subtle distinction, but I just think of it as a matrix. And so the diagonal elements are called, they're the scalar moments of inertia. The off diagonal elements, and there's only three independent off diagonal elements. So I12, I13, I23. This is just terminology. They're called products of inertia. And I honestly don't have a good interpretation for them. Sorry. But they can, you can get rid of them. I mean, you can get rid of them. They're, they're sort of an artifact of not picking the best frame. There is such a thing as picking the best frame for this calculation. And you can get it by first picking any frame. So once you've found the center of mass, so if this is my body, actually, I, I want something more arbitrary. And I just happen to have a potato. Potato is a pretty arbitrary shape. I'm going to assume it's constant density. I don't know what's going on inside a potato. But I'll pick some frame, attach it to my potato. Pick just arbitrarily, maybe, a B1, B2, and B3 direction. And knowing the mass distribution, and I'm also centered at the center of mass. So imagine I'm inside the potato. If I'm, I would calculate each of these six numbers, the three moments of inertia and the three products of inertia. But then I'm, maybe I'm not picking the best frame. There may be some other frame. There actually is. There'll be some other frame where there's off diagonal elements go away. And that is called a principal axis frame. So we might say, with a better choice of frame, the off diagonal elements are zero. And that is called a principal axis frame. And it is uh, significant, you might say. So if we had this better choice of frame, then people will write this in different ways. Sometimes it'll be written as B sub P, like the principal axis frame. And the P reminds you that it's principal axis. Book doesn't seem to use any notation like that. Oh, well. It does talk about some using some other frame, but suppose we had this in that perfect frame, then all we would have is diagonal elements. And when we are in this special frame, we refer to the moments of inertia. We drop the I11 and just call it I1. Everything else is zero in this good frame. And this good frame, this does result from the mathematical properties of a symmetric three by three matrix. So if you haven't seen that, the, for a symmetric three by three matrix, for each of the positive real eigenvalues, there'll be a corresponding real eigenvector. And the set of three eigenvectors actually forms an orthogonal basis. So it forms another basis. That's not true for just general three by three matrices. You'll get you know, directions that may not be 90 degrees away from each other. But in this case, you do. We'll do a calculation like that because it's important. So this... Better frame, the principal axis frame, you get these diagonal inertia entries, which are called so I1, I2, I3 are the principal moments of inertia. And there's an, an additional constraint on what the matrix for a realistic body, including a potato, what you could get. You just get it from looking at the integrals that defined each of these. There's a set of inequality constraints. Like for a realistic body, that means like a mass distribution that's possible must have the following in quality constraints. And it's that I1 plus I2 needs to be greater than or equal to I3. And then there's two more. And I don't know if you've heard the term cyclic permutation, but a cyclic permutation means you just sort of move everything over. You keep the equation kind of as it is and then just move everything over. Like this goes here, this goes here, and then this goes back here. So we'd say plus cyclic permutations. So what do I mean? I mean, we move I1 over to this side, uh, I2 goes over here, and then I3 comes back to the front. And then you do it again. This now, I1 moves over to the right. I2 goes up to the front. I3 moves over one as well. So these three inequality constraints, 
And this is in equation uh, 418. So that has to be true for any realistic body. And you could look at example 4.2 where it says, oh, here's, here are three principal moments of inertia. One of them represents something that could be real. The other one does not. So that's, that's cool. So we've got these three properties for what this matrix should be. So if you do a calculation, you should find, ah, it's symmetric. If you take its eigenvalues, they all need to be positive. And I guess I didn't mention, but these principal moments of inertia, these are the eigenvalues of, if you were to just have the matrix, but in whatever initial uh, frame you chose, maybe you didn't choose the best frame, I mean, the principal axis frame. It's not obvious for certain things like the potato or a triangle. Like what? I don't know. Like what's the obvious directions of symmetry? These will tend to be related to axes of symmetry. So if you have a symmetric body like this here, right, it has an obvious symmetry axis. So this direction, the axis of the can is going to be different than the other two. And the moment of inertia, principal moments of inertia about the other two should be the same but then it'll be something different along that other direction. But this has, because of its shape, it'll have three directions. Like, oh, there should be some direction there. Perpendicular to each of the faces. What are those faces? Those would be the elements of the BP frame, the axes. I wonder if we should try to find a principal axis frame. I'll first say something about if you had any other frame. So uh, transforming the moment of inertia matrix between body fixed frames. And maybe I'll do this, the arbitrary looking potato thing or asteroid if you want. But I know where the center of mass is. Uh, I'll say it's here, there it is. And just for convenience, I chose some directions that were easy to use, but there's this other set of directions that maybe I wanna use. I'll call those F1, F2, and F3. It needs to be a right-handed coordinate system, right? So B, the B directions form a right-handed coordinate system. What does it mean? It means a B1 cross B2 equals B3. It's a right-handed coordinate system. Same for F. F is another body fixed frame that's a right-handed coordinate system. So F1 cross F2 equals F3. And the way I've drawn it, that, that does hold. Use your right hand. F1 cross F2. Thumbs point in yeah, three direction. And now that we're experts in transforming between frames, the direction cosine matrix that takes you from the B frame to the F frame, we write it this way. This is the direction cosine matrix. I don't like saying cosine all the time because there's the rotation matrix, okay? It's the rotation matrix that takes you from B directions to the F directions. How so, right? We write F equals F, B, B. And this is just shorthand for F1, F2, F3, written as a vector, or as the book calls it, vectrix. And then this F, B is gonna be some three by three rot rotation matrix, B1, B2, B3. Okay, so if, if we have F, B, if we've already calculated, say, the moment of inertia matrix with respect to the center of mass and with respect to these B frame directions, how do we go to the moment of inertia viewed in the F frame? I guess you could say, well, I'll just recalculate all those integrals, but you don't need to do all that. That would be unnecessary. So here's what it would be. And I'm just gonna write it. If you want, you could read more about where it comes from you'll write the transformation this way. And then this is F, B, transpose. So this is how you transform the moment of inertia matrix between different body fixed frames. In the book, this is equation 4.27. And I've said this is a symmetric matrix. How do you find a principal axis frame? I don't know how long potatoes last. I got this out of a bag two weeks ago. And it's just been on my desk. The dog hasn't touched it. We're seeking the F frame, which is the principal axis frame. So that means we're seeking the directions F1, F2, and F3. The procedure is you start with a 
inertia matrix, I might just call it an inertia matrix, calculated in your initially chosen body fixed frame. And maybe this was a frame just chosen for convenience, or you're given a CAD model. Here's what the satellite mass distribution is. It's in a CAD file. Calculate the moments of inertia. So you start with this, it'll be some numbers. You've done your calculation. You should check that it has these properties. Is it symmetric? Is it positive definite? I guess you don't, you won't know that until the next step. You could first, you could just visually check that it's symmetric. So maybe I'll even put that as a note. Pro tip, check that it is symmetric. Then you can calculate the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues will be these principal moments of inertia, I1, I2, I3. And they will have corresponding eigenvectors, and I'll write it as v1, v2, v3. Depending on the algorithm you use, like I, I don't know if it'll be Python or Fortran or MATLAB. Let's say MATLAB. I, I'll do a MATLAB demo. These eigenvectors might not be normalized. The algorithm you use might not spit them out in the correct order to create a right-handed coordinate system. So it depends. So you need to normalize these vectors, meaning vi equals vi as a vector divided by the magnitude for each of them, and then pick them so that they form a right-handed coordinate system. Let's say you just take f1 to be v1 hat. Then if you take f2 to be v2 hat, check to see if f1 cross F2 equals V3. It might not. It might be like negative V3. So if so, F3 equals V3. I think the only other option you would get is that it's negative, or you have to just, you keep playing around till it seems to work out. There would be another check. I guess I didn't mention it. Once you got these eigenvalues, check they satisfy the inequality constraints. First of all, they should all be positive and real. If they're not positive, You've done something wrong. And they should satisfy the inequality constraints above. Now, then what? Once you've picked vectors that all seem to work out, once you've got your right-handed coordinate system, then FB, you would write your matrix as, I'll write it this way. Remember, these are the F unit vectors written in the B frame components. So it's already set up for you to just write out these F unit vectors as column vectors, and it becomes your rotation matrix. So F1, and these dots just mean write it as rows. F2, and then assuming F1 cross F2 equals F3, you might have to switch some signs or something. So write the Fs as row vectors, and and then you're done. So in MATLAB, I think the, the syntax would be like F1 hat transpose or F2 hat transpose, F3 hat trans. If you've written your Fs as column vectors, then with that, you can, you could double check, right? FB times your initial matrix times FB transpose. And hopefully it gives you if you've done things right, the moment of inertia in this good frame. And it'll be to numerical precision, it'll be I1, I2, I3. So I don't know if you've had the math courses where it talks about diagonalizing matrices. Basically, we've diagonalized a matrix. And often it'll be, it, this is due to the fact that the, the transformation for rotation matrices, FB inverse is the same as FB transpose. So we have transformed our three by three matrix into um, its diagonalized representative, the eigenbasis. Now it, you could go even further here because let's say I've got for my potato, I chose some frame that's convenient and maybe this other frame is like super duper rotated far away. Maybe I wanna pick the directions that are closest so I might have to rearrange F1, F2, and F3 to get the sort of closest rotation, right? We know how to measure rotations. The one way to measure rotations would be to calculate that the axis in the Euler uh, axis angle 
way of writing things, a measure of how far the F frame is from the B frame is the Euler angle B. And this was inverse cosine of one half the trace of this FB matrix minus one. This is in radians. So that means you could possibly rearrange these to pick the smallest rotation. So we're going to do a numerical MATLAB example, which it's similar to example 4.4. In the book, they've got some matrix and they just call it I. I guess we can call it IB if we want. So this is the moment of inertia about the center of mass, but uh, and written in some initially chosen B frame. Here is one, seven, one, negative one. I think I can just do this. Uh, one, six, negative two. And now for this to be symmetric, right? Now this needs to be negative one, negative two. And this last thing, is, I'll just use eight. So that's my matrix. So this would be the moment of inertia matrix that I've calculated. Now I could get eigenvalues and just see what happens with that. Let me type eigs, IB. Okay. So I've done some checks. I can see visually that this matrix is symmetric. I, I mean, I guess I could do this too. IB transpose minus IB. All right. Oh, what do you know? It's all zeros. I've done my eigs and I see that they are real. They're positive. Now, do they match these inequality constraints? Just somewhat arbitrarily, I'll pick that the first one is I1. So the first principal moment of inertia. The second one is I2. And then the third one is I3. Although that is, that's often the convention to choose I1 is the largest. I2 is the second largest and I3 is the smallest. But, so, okay, I1 plus I2, that is greater than or equal to I3. So that's good. There's probably some way you could code this, you know, to check if blah, blah, blah. But I'm just sort of visual, visually doing this. What's the next one? Uh, it would be I3 plus I1, that's definitely greater than I2, the second one. Now what's this last one? I move things over I2 plus I3, and that's greater than I1. Not by much, but it is greater. That's good. So it checks, this works. It is a legitimate representation of some body. And you might've been like weirded out why are they negatives? How can there be negatives? I thought this represented like a mass distribution. It just works out that way. You may have negatives. Key thing is that the eigenvalues are not negative and they match those inequality constraints. All right, so now we want the best frame and the best frame would come from finding the corresponding eigenvectors to those eigenvalues. So the command for that in MATLAB Right. Instead of eigs, it's eig of the I B. So what is this going to spit out? And see, it did it in some weird order here. <laughs> Along the diagonal, it reversed the order. So the way MATLAB works, this is a column vector. This is the eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 4.7. This is the eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 6.3. And this is the eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 9.8. I can, as a guess, I'll say V1 is the first column, V, V2, second column. Maybe I'll write little v's. And V3 equals V, the third column. I'm going to do what's the cross product of V1 with V2? It turns out it's equal to V3. It's not always going to do that. Now, okay, now here is a problem. Maybe I want the largest principal moment of inertia to be along my first direction, which means I want F1 to be V3 because then the corresponding eigenvalue will be the largest 
I want I want to be D33. If I just say that's how I'm setting my F1 direction, what if maybe I want F2 to be V2 and I2 is the second one. The only one left is V1. Okay, what about cross F1, F2? Hmm. It's negative V1. So that means F3, I'll define it to be negative V1. So let me do cross F1, F2, and then maybe subtract F3. This is a 10 to the negative 15. So to machine precision, I've got my right-handed coordinate system. What I expect is that in the F frame, I should have my moment of inertia matrix look like that. So let me write what FB is. FB is going to be F1 transpose, just to make it look like a book, I guess. F2 transpose, F3 transpose. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I guess I could check that this is a rotation matrix. So that means the transpose times itself, that's like the inverse times the matrix should be, it's the identity matrix. It looks like it's basically three by three identity. Okay, good. So I F is F B times I C, no I B times F B transpose. And it's, I'm hoping it looks like this thing up here. It does. These things that are negative zeros, zero, there's probably like 10 to the negative 15. It's, it's tiny. Yay. Okay. So that means I've got my matrix. I could even now find out phi in degrees is inverse cosine or a cos is the syntax for MATLAB. One half times trace of FB minus one. And I'm, I'm interpreting this in terms of degrees because that's easier for me. So wow, it's a lot of degrees. That means the rotation between my initially given frame, whatever it was, and this other frame is a pretty big rotation. But I did this because I wanted my new F my new body fixed direction, F1, to correspond to the largest principal moment of inertia. So that's, that's it. The principal axes are important because it's just easier to deal with a diagonal matrix than it is with some other weird matrix. But it also it aids in interpretation. So you might be concerned, like, why do we want the principal axis? Mathematically, it is easier and it gives the directions around about which pure rotation is possible. So it gives F1, F2, and F3 our directions about which, and maybe this won't make much sense, pure rotation is possible. This is looking ahead. It's not obvious why this would be true yet. Looking ahead to when we finally write Euler's equations. For this mass, the principal axes directions are actually the same as what I've got here. So this, this object out in space, so on, on the space station, I could get this spinning exactly around each of these three directions. Some other direction that's not aligned with any of these three, there won't be pure rotation possible about that direction. You'll see tumbling and wobbling. So there are special directions that for a rigid body, you can get pure rotation. And this is important for satellites because they often want to be we'll talk about spin stabilization. So each of, of these three, two of the directions are stable and one of the directions is unstable. So you never want to get something spinning around the unstable direction because then it'll tumble and go crazy. And of the two that are stable, one is more stable than the other long-term. And this has had consequences for satellites. Uh, Explorer 1 was a satellite that was spinning around an axis that was not long-term stable. So it started tumbling out of control. Millions of dollars were lost. This will become more clear when we get deeper into the free rigid body dynamics. Free here means there's no moments. That's the weird thing about rigid bodies. Even when there's no moment acting on them, they can still have interesting dynamics. Whereas a particle with no force acting on it just moves in a straight line forever. But not so, not so for um, the rigid body dynamics, it's more complicated. If you have an arbitrary mass distribution, like the potato, there's a way match up with what you probably already know from statistical descriptions of things. 
So these are the mass moments of a rigid body summarized. Let me end 